My story, I was, I became a Christian about 20 years ago. I was 19 years old. And I was introduced right away to a radical group of people. And when I say radical, I don't mean they were better than others, but they were like on fire. I mean, we're at the bowling alley sharing the gospel. And we're, you know, at 19, there are a lot of things you do at 19, okay? And I was introduced to this group of people that like, they didn't do what everybody else was doing. Even the people that were going to the young adult group at church, they were all going to the dirty bird after young adult group. And these guys and gals were like, hey, let's go pray. And I'm like, yeah, of course, that, that's what we do. That's exactly what we do. And we would go into a room and they would like pray for like two hours. And that was normal. And, and, and what, what I saw in their life though was this dynamic. I saw God move through these people. I saw boldness. That was another thing that I saw very clearly in their life. They were very bold. And I don't mean brash. I don't mean rude. I mean they were bold with the gospel. They were not ashamed to live their faith out loud. And I loved that. And I thought this is exactly what I want and what I want to be a part of. And one of the practices that they had in their life was not just prayer, but also fasting, which is what we're talking about today. And so I was introduced to fasting because I saw the benefits or the dynamic of their spirituality, and I found it to be something very important biblically. And I went on a journey in the Bible, which is kind of what we're going to do today. There's not one passage I'm going to land on. We're going to go sort of all over the place, uh, which is always a good thing to do when you're just bringing up a, a topic. But let's just go ahead and define fasting real quickly before we continue. So what is a fast? And this is a basic definition. I would say when a group of individual, uh, individual, a group or an individual abstains from food for a time in order to seek God through prayer. That would be a definition of fasting. I've heard another definition that's a little more simple. I think it's Derek Prince's definition. He would say it's to abstain from food for spiritual purposes. I had somebody email me not long ago because my email address is on the Dedicate program bulletin and somebody asked me, hey, I noticed that I get up every day and I pray and I seek God every day and sometimes I look back over the day and I notice that I haven't eaten and maybe it was because I was focusing on the Lord. Would you consider that a fast? And I said, no, I, I wouldn't. Um, I mean, God's the one you need to ask about that, but if it, a fast is intentional. It's not about looking back and being unintentional. If you live your life before the Lord every day and you pray every day and you read the word every day and you seek God every day, that's awesome. But fasting is about separating ourselves specifically. And a lot of times in the Bible, it's about doing so as a community. It's so important to do that. So the, the word fast literally means to abstain. And this has always been understood in the 70 passages in the Bible that mention fasting. It's always been understood as abstaining from food. Now on this little handout that we have given you for the last several weeks, and I'll re reference it at the end of my talk today, it says on there that there's such a thing as a media fast. And I would actually consider that more of a context or a concession. Um, if you can abstain from food, then you, then you want to be, and I'm encouraging you to practice what the Bible teaches in that regard. If you cannot abstain from food, I consider this a concession. I do think abstaining from social media and all these things are important, but I don't think it has to be for spiritual purposes you know, either. I think it's important just to do that so that we unplug anyways. But it's a good context, I think, for us to begin to focus on the Lord. But there are 70 passages in the Bible that talk about fasting, roughly. And one of them is in the Old Testament, Le Leviticus chapter 16, verse 31. Israel was required to fast on the Day of Atonement. And uh, even Orthodox Jews still into this day, Yom Kippur is how they celebrate the Day of Atonement. And they still fast. And they understand that verse, to afflict the soul, would be interpreted as to not eat for that whole day. And they still practice this. Orthodox Jews do today. In the New Testament, the church fasted together for breakthrough and specific answers, some of those that we'll go over today. And it's important to realize that even throughout church history, that their understanding from the first century on was fasting was an important part of how they would practice their spirituality uh, throughout history. We would see this. Actually, I was reading an account from John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement, and he would not ordain pastors to the ministry unless they fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays. It's, I don't know how many would make it, you know. I'm sorry, do you mean not eat for two days? Is that be, to be a pastor? No, I'm, I'm going to go do something else. But it's, it's interesting when you read church history, some of the things that you find. On one 
on one hand, fasting is about abstaining, but on the other hand, it's not just about not eating, it's about focusing on the Lord. In fact, the picture that I have is, is that like when you have binoculars and you wanna focus in on something, it really requires an intentionality. And I see fasting as something that really provides that. It, start, it causes us to be able to press into God in ways that we're sometimes, quite frankly, oblivious. I don't know about you, but if you do like a reflection of your year or even of your month, you can see how you've picked up little habits along the way. Anybody with me on this? And like, I don't even know why I do that. And you can pick up these little habits and you start watching a show and all of a sudden you're binge watching. Come on, somebody. You're binge watching. You're just wasting your life away. I didn't say that. Somebody else said that. I'm just quoting them. <laughs> and all of a sudden, things that were never important to you, no matter how long you've known the Lord, these things were never important to you. You never spent any time in them. All of a sudden, you're doing them a lot more than you ever realized. And when we take inventory, we, one of the things we want to do is sift through our life and realize this is not important. This has no eternal consequence. This is not something I want to spend a lot of my time on. God has other things for me to do. It causes us to focus. When you fast, it brings Jesus into HD clarity. It really does. Fasting requires a level of sacrifice, and I believe giving up food is a serious sacrifice for a period of time. Of course, here's what fasting is not. Fasting is not a divine diet. Come on, somebody. <laughs> fasting is not a cure for every problem. Right? So sometimes we think, oh, I'm really going to start praying and I'm really going to start fasting so that all of these things in my life go away. All these things in your life are not going to go away because you fast and pray. And I think it's important that we begin to press into God and pray and seek him in all things. But we don't do so just to get an answer. In fact, fasting is not just about getting something from God. Fasting is not to change God. Fasting changes us. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, is what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1. We have everything we need for life and godliness. We have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. But I know, and you know, that we have a lot of blocks, and we pick up more blocks that, be, that are in the way. They become like the dam. No pun intended. Sorry. They become this block for the life of God flowing through, fl flowing through us, Right? And so fasting is one of those ways to remove the stumbling blocks that hinder what Jesus wants to do in our life. Fasting is not a substitute for giving, loving, serving, and praying. It's not a substitute for any other spiritual practice. It's just one of the spiritual practices that we have. Fasting doesn't change God. It changes us, as I've said. And it's not for the strong. Sometimes we think it's for the really disciplined people. You know what I've noticed? When you make a decision to start praying and seeking God and fasting, the Holy Spirit will start to accompany your life as you make that decision in a way that otherwise he would not. When you commit yourself to spiritual things, the Holy Spirit commits himself to that very step of faith. So if you feel hesitant to step into this, because I, I know we've been doing this eight years I walk up to people at church all the time, and I know there's gonna, I'm just going to roll out the conviction right now. I'll walk up to people all the time at church, and I'll say, so how are you fasting? <laughs> and I see that look, like I see when I go to the movie theater, and I see somebody at the movie theater, and I go, what movie are you watching? And they go, well, um, you know, they don't want to tell me, you know, that it's like Saw 25 that they're watching. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I get that all the time. It's just like, what movie are you watching? Uh, well, you know, I'm just here. <laughs> really like the popcorn, and I'm just going to mosey into one of these places, Pastor, because they don't know what I'm going to think. They don't know what I'm going to think. They're gonna, I'm going to think exactly what they think I'm going to think. <laughs> Shouldn't be watching this movie. But I'm still, I still love you. I'm just... should be watching that movie, but... But I know, I know what it's like to talk about fasting or even to think about it, and maybe you haven't practiced it before. Well, that's a place of learning for you then. That's all it is. But you cannot know about fasting unless you fast. I can give you the information today. I'm going to give you some of that. But you just can't know. You, you know what I'm saying? You can't know about this unless you step into it. You just can't. And so I'm going to do my best at pushing you that way. I want to talk to you just a little bit about the purpose of fasting. And I have 20 minutes to do so. We're going to fly by this, okay? I'm going to give you four reasons why we fast. And the first one is this. We fast in response to Jesus. As I've already shared, fasting was practiced by Orthodox Jews in response to Leviticus 16. In the Old Testament, they also would call community fasts. 
This would happen several times throughout the Old Testament. But lest we think it's some kind of Old Covenant principle, fasting transcends Old Covenant into the New Covenant. We see this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. And Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount, which is profound. He says, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, there's that second time Jesus says when you fast, which by the way is the impl- gives us the implication that we will and should fast. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret, or what is done in secret will reward you, and another translation says reward you openly. And here's the couple things that you can notice from this passage. Number one, it seems to me that Jesus fully expects those that he's talking to to fast. And the three things that he mentions in Matthew chapter 6 is giving and fasting and prayer. And he, he brings these right alongside each other, giving, fasting, and prayer. And these are what he actually calls practicing righteousness. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Do not practice your righteousness in such a way where you be noticed by men. Don't practice your righteousness this way, but he he does want us to practice righteousness. And the three things that he actually rolls out as practicing righteousness are giving, fasting, and prayer. And I think we've lost fasting and we need to reclaim it. And there's a power that is attached to us seeking God in, in this way. Jesus says, whenever you fast. And the implication is clearly there. And he talks about fasting as something that we do before the Father. We're not doing it to be noticed by each other. Now, I want to say this. Sometimes people have this kind of strange idea that when they fast, they don't want to tell anybody. That's not exactly what Jesus is saying. Like, I don't want to tell you I'm not eating today, even though we're going to lunch, and somehow I'm going to spend my lunch trying to figure out how to not lie and not tell you. You know, No, he's just saying, when you fast, don't seek to be noticed by people. He was saying the hypocrites... Their motivation for doing spiritual things was so that other people would think well of them. He's saying, don't, do, don't go out of your way. But when you're fasting, you need to go out of your way not to be noticed by other people that wouldn't otherwise know that's what you're doing. Practice your righteousness in a way where it's something that God knows and you and him have as you walk out your spiritual life. And just think about that for a minute. If you and I practice our spirituality in a way where it's something that us and God have and nobody else gets invited into that, that's pretty powerful. And the question really is, what are those practices? What are those things that you're praying? What are those things that you're doing? How about the fast that you and God have and nobody else is invited into that? Your father who sees in secret. He knows in secret. He sees in secret. And you're offering this to God. Father, I'm doing this. This is you and me. I'm asking for you to shape my heart. I'm asking for you to dig in. I'm asking for you to do something, and I'm not doing it so that anybody else would notice me. I'm not asking to be spiritual in everyone else's eyes. I'm just asking to be your son. I'm asking to be your daughter and to walk this out with you. Did you know that Jesus fasted at the beginning of his ministry, throughout his ministry, and that Statement that we usually make is if the Son of God needed to fast, how much more do we? Jesus fasted several times. And there's this interesting idea that I've heard. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but there's this idea that, hey, we're, we're under the new covenant. You know, Jesus died, rose again, and we no longer need to fast. You know, it's, it's not something that we need to do. And I don't know where this really comes from, but it's not accurate. Because, number one, you see people fasting throughout the New Testament, which is after Jesus not only rose again, but ascended to be with the Father. But we see what Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, verse 18. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came to Jesus and they said, Why do John's disciples uh, and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? They came to Jesus and asked him this. And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in that day. And I read this, and I thought, this is an interesting passage. Jesus is actually talking about his presence. He's saying, I'm with them right now. We celebrate. But when I'm not with them any longer, there's something to them fasting, and they will continue to do what you're suggesting. But they just understand that I'm with them right now. 
Fasting is not just about getting something from God. It's about focusing on and experiencing the presence of God. When he is with us, when he will be with us, we don't fast. When he's away, physically speaking, we will. Fasting first is in response to Jesus. Secondly, we fast to humble ourselves before God. You know, pride is not just the devil's sin. Amen. Okay. It's like crickets. Pride is not just the devil's sin. In fact, many people have said that fasting is a God-ordained way of humbling ourselves. Pride is such an interesting, very intricate, and an even sophisticated type of sin. We tend to think of pride as like the person that thinks they're better than everybody. And everybody looks at that guy or gal and says, they're prideful, which is kind of funny that you would say that. Sort of takes some pride to say that somebody said, don't, I mean, you agree with me, right? It's like, I will not be around anybody that's judgmental. It's like, you kind of have to judge people to, to I don't know, you know, I mean, <laughs> the shoe fits, right? Kick it off. Don't wear it and walk around in it. What do you think I was trying to teach you this morning? We humble ourselves before God, but I, I think it's interesting that when you think about pride, it's not just an I'm better than you. Pride has all kinds of heads. Pride has all kinds of manifestations. And I think that we need to know that there are times where we're prideful. And you know, one of the things that we do, and, and, and you're around people like I am, is we say this. We go, oh, I know we're all not perfect. And then the question that we need to have is, well, in what specific area am I not perfect? See, to not know how to answer that question, it may mean that you're not sure about you being not so, you know, you being a great person. You, we have to be able to zero in on the things that Jesus is pruning in our life, transforming in our life, working on in our life. We're not coming to church this morning because we got it all figured out. Nobody's sitting here in these seats and we came to church because we're the elite and everybody else is not in this building is no good. That's not church, right? And we get disillusioned because we come to church and we feel like we get mistreated or so-and-so didn't do this or somebody said that and the pastor didn't seem very nice. Not Pastor Ben, but we have other pastors. I mean, I was talking about another church. I wasn't. I'm trying to lighten up fasting, okay? Just smile with me this morning. I'm talking about not eating food, okay? And everybody's going to feel guilty when they go for that donut right after the service. Can I... Pastor Ben, can I get half? Is that, can we, can we do half what we're normally doing? When you look in the Bible in the Old Testament, the book of Ezra gives us an example of Ezra calling a community fast. In chapter 8, we read how Ezra was assigned the task of leading some of the Jewish exiles from Babylon back to Jerusalem. And this is an interesting story because it's, it's a dangerous journey. And it says that he didn't want to ask the king for guards to accompany them because he'd already basically told the king that we're going to be okay. Like, we're going to be okay. Like, our God is going to protect us. God will lead the way. God will sustain us. He's already told the king that, so he doesn't want to go back to the king and say, by the way, could you give us some guards? And so it says in Ezra chapter 8 that he calls a fast. It's a four-month journey, and they have children. And it's a dangerous journey with robbers and all kinds of things. It says in Ezra 8, verse 21, Then I proclaimed a fast at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek him, a safe journey for us, our little ones, and our possessions. And I just thought about that. He called a fast for the protection of God on their four-month journey. And if you continue in the story, it says that God took care of them and sustained them and watched over them. And he answered, God answered their prayers, and God was with them. And as, that was what he decided that needed to happen. And this is, this is sort of the thought that I had as a result of that. In the midst of your life, my life, the things that we have going on, is, is that the idea that comes to us in the midst of something difficult? Let's fast and pray right now. Parents, are you going through a tough time with your children? Is the first thing that comes to your mind? Let's start fasting and praying. I remember when our older boys were, were growing up, and I didn't know how to be a dad at all. I mean, I think I'm a little better at it now. But during those days, I mean, I was just like at a loss. Things were going on, and you can't control people. <laughs> Life would just be so much better. 
if we would seek God, <laughs> what did you think I was going to say? But there are times you just realize more than any other time you cannot control your reality. You can't. And you have to look up. You actually have to look up. You actually have to come to God. And you feel that sense of desperation. And I, I believe that the desperate get delivered. I believe the desperate begin to move into a place of prayer and seeking. And it shouldn't just take that, but it's amazing how that desperation will bring something out of us. And it did when, when I was raising, my wife and I were raising our older boys, her and I would just fast. I was like, I don't know what else to do. Sometimes when people come to me for counseling, I have no idea what to say. Like literally, not ashamed to say it. It has not changed, okay? Been pastoring for some time now, and it's still exactly the same as it was. I do not know what to say. But one of the things I do now, and I've told people this in the midst of their problem, is like, would you be willing to fast and pray with me to break through this issue? And as we do that, what I've noticed is it's not about getting you know, the issue out of your life per se. It's about focusing on the things that are causing this to, to continue in your life. And that's what would happen when Bridget and I would pray over and fast over our children is we realized that there were things that we weren't doing. There were investments that we weren't making. There were times that we weren't spending with our kids. There were things that God had called us to that we had just dropped. And that fast became a focus and we all of a sudden came into a place of repentance. And don't you love repentance? Yes. Repentance actually breaks the power of shame because we can repent for what we haven't done. We can repent for the things that we should have done. We can repent and stand before God and thank him that Jesus is enough, paid enough, and he can bring us into a new day of doing things differently. Fasting actually starts to bring up the stuff that we need to repent of. And one of those things is pride. Pride actually keeps us, I call it the armor of hell. Pride is the armor of hell. It keeps bad things in and it keeps good things from, from, from getting into us and bad things from coming out of us. It's the armor of hell. We can't change with, with pride. You know, it's, it's not only the devil's sin, but I think it's our sin as well. The other day I was doing a little uh, devotional on humility, and that's what I've been praying this year. Lord, I want to be, I want to humble myself. I don't want to be humbled. <laughs> Amen. It didn't work out good for Nebuchadnezzar. I don't want to be that. <laughs> like, for real. You know, he was like crawling on all fours. Bad. So I don't pray God humble me. I don't. That just sense, doesn't make sense to me. But I, the Bible does say, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might lift you up. Jesus taught a parable where he talked about humbling yourself and going to the lowest place of the table. Because there's only, when you go to the bottom, there's, there's only one way you can go, and that's forward. And that's up. So Jesus teaches about humility. So I did this little Bible study on humility, and I wrote out, like, all these verses. I went through the Bible, all these verses on humility. And, you know, conviction city. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it was just one after another, after another, after another on humility. And I determined something at the end of my little Bible study. I'm not humble. <laughs> it's not to, you know, smash myself. It's just to say this. It's that humility is not something that comes natural. It's, it's of the Holy Spirit, that he would bring us to a place of repentance and awareness so that we would repent and come to him and he would transform our hearts. But humility is, is so essential you know, and I was thinking, um, I was reading some old journals from men and women of God, you know, years and years and years ago. They're no longer with us. And I was reading some of the, some of the journals, like John Wesley and others. And one of the things that they would do is they would pray and they would get on their knees and pray. I don't know if you've been around this practice a lot or not. But I was a part of a group of people where that's how we prayed. We always prayed on our knees. And you know, it's, it's interesting. When you can't go to your knees before God... And there's something that just, you know, I'm cool. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? There's something, there's something weird about this, isn't there? Anybody with me on this? Like there's something strange about that feeling that won't do this. Like, no, I'm, I'm okay. Pastor Ben, I know you're trying to tell us to do something spiritual. I don't, I don't know if that's really spirit. You start to debate. This is not an intellectual thing that we're invited into in walking with Jesus, right? It's not about how smart you are. It's about are we going to humble ourselves or, or not? And this thing right here, this is really hard for us to do. And you know why? It's because we have pride. I have pride. I believe it's easier to stand before God when you really do learn how to kneel before God. Right? 
You humble yourself before the Lord. I'm not saying it's just about the physical, but what is it that causes us not to be able to, to do things? I, it's pride. Here's what the Apostle Paul teaches us about humility. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. We're talking about fasting. Humbles our, we humble ourselves before God. He said that we would offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Offer our bodies. You know, that's everything physical. Pastor Chris preached last week about the goal being love. You know, it's powerful, the goal being, being love. And one of his points, he brought up Psalm 24. I think it's three and four or four and five. That's who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his holy place but him who has clean hands and a pure heart and does not lift his soul to another. Him who has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. What you do and what you meditate on, what you think, what you say in your heart, the way you see it's so important that we learn how to purify ourselves. The way that we do that is we submit ourselves. We humble ourselves before God, and fasting is one of the ways to do that. It's a physical thing. And do you know when you do physical things before the Lord that there are spiritual results? There is power. In fact, there's something going on right now that we can't see. There's something going on right now that we can't see. And when we press into things that we cannot see, it's called faith. By the word of God, not just randomly, but the word talks about fasting. The word talks about praying. And we pray. We offer a prayer to God. And we can't see what happens as a result of that. We don't know what's going to happen. We fast. We go without food. And we start to seek God. We don't know what's going to happen as a result of that. But something that, that we have to know in our minds as we do something like this is that God is moving in the spiritual realm in a way that we cannot see. And there are things that are happening. If you read the book of Daniel, you see this. It says, I believe in Daniel chapter 9, that he set himself to begin to fast. And, and there were answers that were going on. Angels that even appeared to him and said, in the day you fasted, God began to answer. These realities are happening even if we don't feel them or see them or even think about them very often. But I must move on. Number three is we fast to hear the voice of God more clearly. After being baptized, Jesus was led into the wilderness where he fasted and he confronts the devil or the devil actually confronts him, and he resists the devil. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What is, this, what is Jesus saying? Well, he's quoting, I believe, Deuteronomy chapter 8 right here which goes back to Exodus 16 and the whole wilderness experience where manna came down from heaven. But there's something that Jesus means out of this is that there is something more important than bread or food, and that is the word of God. The word of God created all things. The word of God sustains all things. The word of God can empower all things. And the physical is just the physical, but there is something more powerful than our created reality, and that is the word of the one who created our reality. And it's what he's trying to say is that I'm not going to submit to your temptation, which just isn't about food. There's something more powerful at stake. I'm not just trying to see if I can't eat for a period of time. There's something I'm going after right now. Jesus was pressing in for something on behalf of humanity. It wasn't just a selfish thing. It wasn't just Jesus was trying to get healthy. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're an intermittent faster, me too. Amen. Love it. It's good stuff. But Jesus is pressing in, focusing, and he's resisting the enemy. I believe through fasting and prayer we, we receive from God in a way that we otherwise wouldn't. He said... It's the words that proceed from the mouth of God. We need the words that proceed from God. First, we need the word of God, which is the eternal truth for every person and every generation. But the Holy Spirit begins to make this word come alive in us. Give us revelation and understanding into the word even that we're reading. Acts chapter 13, verse 1 and 3. This is the early church. And listen to what it says. Now, there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, 
Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Listen to this. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed, or finished fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. And if you remember in the book of Acts, this is Paul's first missionary journey. And I just want to point out something. The context for the greatest apostolic ministry to be sent out in his first missionary journey was fasting and prayer. And, and I believe this with all my heart, based on scripture, that in that context, God could take Mill Creek Foursquare Church or any church or the church in Linwood or the church in Everett, and he could burst something greater than anything we can do in the physical. If we begin to focus on God, if we begin to press in in prayer and fasting, as we see in Scripture, something starts to happen inside of us and get launched from us. That is the context for the first missionary journey. And you say, Ben, it's not all about prayer and fasting. You're right. It's not all about prayer and fasting. But you got to remember what I already said. It's not a substitute for serving and loving and giving and all of that. It accompanies it. But to pray and fast without serving and being sent that's not going to come, that's not, that's not going to bring about a lot. But when you accompany the two together, this is powerful before God. This is powerful before God. And the fourth is we fast to overcome the flesh. I think it's interesting when you read Genesis chapter 1 through 3 that the medium by which all humanity fell into sin is some kind of fruit. I mean, it just, it sort of just strikes me as not odd, but like, yeah, that makes sense. When you eat this fruit, you shall die. The devil says, when you eat this fruit, you will not die. See, it's not really about fruit, is it? It's not really about, you know, gluttony is not about food, right? And, and greed isn't about money. Sexual immorality isn't about sex. There's something deeper underneath all of this. There's something greater that really is, is happening. I, I've learned one of the things that happens when you fast, when we fast, is you start to overcome that nature that wants to just do what's wrong. You know, we, we all have it. We all have, the th we have these things that we do, the flesh, the sinful nature. Jesus paid a price to overcome that so that now we're not in bondage to sin anymore, but we still make decisions out of the old nature that reflect the person that Jesus is delivering us from and has delivered us from. And one of the ways, if you are stuck right now, if you're stuck in some kind of bondage, maybe you wouldn't call it addiction. Let's just say you haven't been able to get free from something. Technically, that's an addiction. But if you haven't been able to get free of gossip, slander, envy, lust, pornography, sexual immorality, if you have not been able to get free from this and you've read book after book and you feel guilty and there's guilt, fast and pray. Fast and pray. Seek the Lord in fasting and prayer. You say, Ben, I don't know about that. Have you done it? Have you done it for a prolonged period of time? 21 days. Dedicate. Overcome the flesh. We know we're at war in ourselves. Our selfishness unchecked will lead us to a life focused on, on self. Paul actually said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, that he disciplines his body so that he himself did not become disqualified. What do we think he meant by that? I discipline my body. Did he beat himself up? No. He told his stomach, he told his mind, he told his heart, by the power of the Spirit of God and the strength of the Word, I am not going to be subject to your cravings. I am going to follow Jesus no matter what. So when we go into fasting, you're going to have some, you have some headaches. You give up food for a meal or two meals or a day, you have some headaches. People say, oh, I can't fast because I have headaches. We all have headaches, okay? You got to press through that. Don't work out at Planet Fitness too hard. Fun fact, I was down at Planet Fitness. I was talking to the staff there, and I said, how many members do you have at your gym? And he said, on average, we have 10,000 members per gym. I looked around. There's about 50 people there. <laughs> I said, how many of those 10,000 members do you see? And he said, pretty much who you see right here. <laughs> we all have good intentions, but we lack that self-discipline, and you don't have to grit it out. The Bible says that self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So what we lack, we ask him to provide. Amen? Now, Sherry, if you would come, i, I got to wrap it up right now. 
Here's some principles for fasting. Say, Ben, practically, how do I do this? It's a great question. First, you need to plan out your fast. I would encourage you to do that. What kind of fast are you doing? Again, if you're fasting social media and media and all that, in a way, I'm telling you that, that if you can fast food, I would push you into fasting a meal or two or whatever. My wife and I, just for practical sake, we're fasting until the five o'clock period. So that's what we're doing. We're just everything up until five and then we eat dinner together. And it's amazing. You think you're just gonna stuff yourself and you really don't, you're like not very hungry. And then we're praying together and we're pressing in. Fasting is focusing on God. It's not just about not doing something. It's about pressing into something that's more important. So what kind of a fast? Um, how long will you fast? Obviously, we're doing a 21 days period. You don't have to do that every day for 21 days, but during this 21 days, let's unite together and seek God for our church, our families, our children, our region, our city. Let's, let's actually believe that God can shape the history of this city and this, this nation by what we do when we come to him in prayer. Number two is plan for time with God. You wanna schedule this out. I'm an iPhone scheduler, so I actually have to have it on my iPhone Maybe that strikes you as odd, but I just sort of have to do it. So whatever you gotta do to make sure that you're spending some more time with God, start with 20 minutes, whatever. Sometimes people overshoot it, they do the hour or two and they can't. Journal your time of fasting. This is, this is my journal. And I just write stuff that I feel is from the Lord. I don't know if it's from God or not most of the time, I just write it down and then I look back and I go, my gosh, that's like exactly what I needed, but I didn't, couldn't understand it in the time that I received it. It was later on that I got it, right? Sometimes God will fill your tank today in order to disperse it at a later date when you actually need it, but you have to spend time with him today in order to store up what he wants to dispense at a later time. That's why we feel that deficit. It's also a longing when we don't have that time with the Lord, we feel that. We feel like we're missing out, but we also feel like we're missing something. So journal your time of fasting and make practical decisions. Get lots of water. Don't work out too hard at Planet Fitness or LA Fitness. Don't work out too hard. You don't have to do that. And then if you're taking medication, obviously you need to be, go by a doctor. I, I don't, we don't give that kind of advice to people as far as like what you should and shouldn't do when you take your medication. That's not, that's up between you and your doctor. But it's important that we don't ignore those kinds of things because you get most of your water from food. So if you go without food, you need to drink twice as much water. That's more, more, than, more often than not why we have headaches. So Pastor Don Kane has a gallon jug of water everywhere he goes. He just carries that jug around. Carry, I don't know if I would do that, Pastor Don, but I love you for it. He's even got like markers on it for how much he drinks. It's really good, it's really disciplined. But just do what you gotta do to, to, to do practical things as well. Here's what it says, Matthew 6, and I close, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. When we put him first, he takes care of the other stuff in our life. Let's not seek those other things. Let's seek the Lord. And one of the ways that we do that is seek him through prayer and through fasting. Will you join the Dedicate Fast? If you are not fasting right now and you're a part of Mill Creek Foursquare Church, will you fast? If you say, I don't know how to, will you learn how to? Will you fast with us? How powerful would it be if every person in this room united in fasting and prayer for a season of time and sought God to change what is going on in our world? Let's stop complaining and let's start praying. Let's stop blaming and pointing the finger. Let's start fasting and praying together as a community. God has the answers. Let's seek him together. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray that not just we hear it, we know it, we understand it, but that we would apply your word. Help us to fast, help us to pray, help us to seek you and experience what otherwise we just simply couldn't. We want you in our life. We desire you wholly and completely. Help us to draw near, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Please stand.